Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhad. In this session, we would look at CPA questions covering specifically FAR, and the topic is the difficult, the dreaded topic, bonds. Bonds is also covered in my intermediate accounting course in details. So how can I help you? Well, if you are taking a CPA course, they do cover bonds, but they do cover it in a review fashion. On my course, Intermediate Accounting, I cover bond in details. I'll explain everything you need to know about bonds from A to Z, and I'll prepare you well, whether you're taking the CPA prep course or the CPA exam. So the reason I'm telling you this is because in this session, I'm going to go over a few questions, answer the questions, show you how to approach these questions. But if you don't understand bonds inside out, it's very easy to fall off the wagon when it comes to bonds. And bonds is an important topic. So if the AI CPA software notices that you are not answering bond questions correctly, there's more likely than not a chance that you will get less than 75. Anyhow, I just would like to remind you to connect with me on LinkedIn if you haven't done so. YouTube is where you would need to subscribe. I have 1,700 plus accounting, audit, finance, tax, as well as Excel tutorial, which eventually it's going to be tested on the CPA exam. If you like my lectures, please like them, share them. It doesn't cost you anything. If they're helping you, it means they help. They might help other people. Connect with me on Instagram. On my website, farhatlectures.com, this is where I have those additional practice and resources that's going to help you master what you need to master. For example, in intermediate accounting too, I cover this topic bonds way, way in details. If you're looking to improve your grade or in, in, increase your understanding or get some supplemental material for your CPA exam, again, I don't replace your CPA prep course. I supplement it. I am a support to, your, to what you have. I explain in detail much, much more than they do. However, I have a you know, a minimal subscription that will help you in increase your grade by 10 to 15%. Beta Inc. issues a bond with a stated rate of 5%. The bond will sell at a premium if. So here they're asking you when will the bond sell at a premium if the stated rate is 5%. I would say this is a basic understanding of bonds. So if I am your instructor and I'm giving you a an exam about the bonds and you cannot answer this question correctly, it means you don't even know the basics. Of bonds here's why well let's see if, if we let's see how we answer it the bond will sell at a premium if the market interest rate is above five percent is that true statement is one a true statement and the answer is no if the market rate if the market rate is greater than five percent which is greater than your offering then your bond will sell at a discount so you need to know that immediately one is out one is out this one is out, this one is out. All what we have to find out now, if true, if two is true, the bond will sell at a premium if the bond pays interest semi-annually rather than annually. And there's no way, if you get this, if, if you answer two is correct, then you have no understanding of how, of how bonds work. It doesn't matter how often the bond pays the interest, whether semi-annually or annually, it doesn't affect if it's gonna be sold at a premium or a discount. It will sell at a premium if the market rate is less than 5%, if the market is offering 4% and you're offering 5%, your bond is offering 5%, then you will sell at a premium, which is none of these statements will comply. Therefore, the answer is D. So simply put, the reason I'm giving you a basic question, just to tell you, if you get this question wrong, you have no understanding. You have close to zero understanding about bonds. So make sure, again, I know I'm gonna be inviting you again and again to my website. There's nothing else I can do except to tell you, go to my website if you wanna really learn the basics and practice. Let's take a look at this question. On July 1st, year one, Google issued 8% bond in the, in the amount of half a million, which matured on July 1st, year 11. The bond were issued for 600, 468,500. It means they were issued at a discount because it's below the par value and the market is 10%. It yield 10%. Interest is payable annually on June. Uh, so the interest is, pay is paid annually. Google Corp uses the effective interest rate method to amortize the discount. That's fine. How much interest expense should Google record on December 31st? So here they're asking us how much interest expense 
and it's on December 31st. How do we compute the interest expense if we are using the effective interest rate method? Well, the interest expense using the effective interest rate method is by taking the beginning of the period book value. The beginning of the period book value is 468,500 because the bond was just issued. So that's the book value multiplied by the market rate, which is 10%. That's going to give us 46,850. Be careful. Be careful. We're being asked on December 31st, the bond was issued July 1st. And this is a common theme that you will see on the CPA exam when they try to trick you with the date. So be careful about the date. So you only compute in this 4.5, which is half a year, which will give you 23,425. Therefore, interest expense as of December 31st is 23,425. So simply put, let's start to build the entry. Interest expense 23425 okay so we saw how we get to here now um, that's the interest expense interest expense interest payable that's the entry how much is the carrying value of the bond on December 31st year one December 31st year one so what happened is this let me pull the calculator here because we're gonna be using the calculator they're asking us about the um, the uh, the carrying value. What's the carrying value? Well, it's the beginning of the period book value, which was 468,500. Then what's going to happen as we amortize, as we amortize discount, we add the amortized discount to the bond. Okay. So the question is, how much discount did you amortize from from uh, from uh, from July 1st from July 1st till December 31st so now we need to go back and kind of think about how are we going to work this how much how much interest expense that we have we had 23,425 now what is the interest payable because we're not going to be paying this interest on December 31st that's why I'm going to be crediting interest Payable, which is the cash amount. How much cash are you going to pay? Well, the bond has a par value of half a million times 8%. Let's see, half a million times 0 0.08. That's 40,000. That's 40,000 times 0.5 because by December 31st, we're only responsible for half. Therefore, interest payable is 20,000. Well, guess what? The difference, the difference between interest expense and interest payable is the amount we are going to, the, the, the discount we are going to amortize. So we are going to amortize discount of, the difference is 3,425. Now, this is the amount that we're going to be amortizing as a discount. What does that mean? It means if the bond had a value when we started the period of four, sorry, a 468, 468, 500. Then we amortized 3,000, uh, 425. How much is the, how much is the, uh, what's the value? It's, uh, let me just do the computation. 468. At this point, I know it's going to end up with 25. The answer is A, but if you have time just double check your computation plus 3425 and that's 25 that's how i know the answer is a because it's end with 25 therefore the answer is 47125 simply put as time goes by you amortize the discount as you amortize the discount with your entry as you record interest expense you add the amortized discount to the book value. Now, the book value or the carrying value is 471,925. Now, again, this was on December 31st. Now, when you pay, when you make the payment on June 30th, you add the amount of the amortization, the amortized amount, then your book value goes up. It keeps on going up until it reaches at maturity, the bond goes back to its par value. So that's why it's very extremely important because bonds, they have many moving pieces. Um, you have to know how to compute your interest expense. That's one computation. You have to know how to compute your interest payable. So notice, 
your expense is 23,425 is more than what you are paying, which is you're going to be, if you were paying, you're only paying 20,000. The reason is because when you issued the dis, when you issued the bond, it's what it was issued at a discount. So the discount is extra expense that you have to expense over the life of the bond. So those are things that you have to understand fairly quickly, fairly quickly. So simply put, because this is a discounted bond, the interest expense will be greater than the cash amount that you pay. Why? Because right from the get-go, let's see what happened right from the get-go. Five, five, uh, 500,000 minus 468, 500. Let's see, 500,000 minus 468, 500. You, were at a, you, you had a discount of 31,500, which is technically interest expense that you have to expense over the life of the bond. And what we did is we expensed some of it in this period. Let's take a look at this question. We don't need the calculator anymore. The amortization of a bond premium. Now we're looking at a bond premium. Each period would impact the financial statements in it in which of the following way. In which of the following way. Interest expense being greater than the amount of cash paid for interest. Hold on, I just said this. Well, yeah, I said this for a for a, for a bond that's issued at a discount. Well, is that true for a bond issued at a premium? No. Interest expense being greater than the amount paid for cash is for a discount bond. So if, if I change this word to a discount, then this answer will be correct. But that's not the end. That's not the question. Cash paid, cash paid for interest being greater than interest expense. Hold on a second. What we're saying here is interest expense is less than the cash. Is this correct statement for a premium bond? And the answer is yes. In a premium bond situation, in a premium bond situation, so let's assume this this was a bond that was issued at five hundred and fifteen thousand. Let's assume this bond was issued five, for five hundred and fifteen. In other words, we had fifteen thousand of premium. Then what's going to happen is when we when we uh, when we compute the cash amount, the interest expense will be lower. So it will be lower by you know, let's assume 1,000, we, we amortize 1,000. Therefore, we debit premium 1,000 and interest expense will be 19,000. So in a premium bond situation, the amount that you pay in cash, which is the interest payable here, is greater than the interest expense recorded. Why? Because you received upfront more money. You received 15,000, which gonna help your interest expense, which will reduce your interest expense. Therefore, cash paid for interest, is greater yes or interest expense is lower i like to kind of follow statement a so your interest expense is lower than your cash and the and the answer is yes why because you received more money up front interest expense and cash paid being equal now if the premium was being amortized using the straight line it doesn't matter whether you're using the straight line or the effective interest rate method interest expense and the cash will not equal to each other in a premium bond the interest expense will be lower none of the above is correct that's incorrect b is correct interest expense will be lower once again a lot of moving pieces when it comes to bonds you want to make sure you are comfortable with those moving pieces otherwise you will fall very quickly and not being able to answer the question correctly and once you understand bond again on my website it's fairly easy to answer these questions those questions will be bring it on it's real easy okay so you have to have a good understanding which of the following is a correct regarding a bond sinking fund? So what is a bond sinking fund? Bond sinking fund is when the company put money away. So what they do is when the bond becomes mature, when, when they have to pay the bond, they have the money to pay it. Why do they do so? Because again, bonds, they, they are large amount of money and they come due all at once. So that's why it's uh, that's why they do this bond sinking fund. So let's see, sinking fund account that are considered to offset bond current bond liabilities can be included with current assets yes that's the definition of a current liability a current liability is something that's going to be offsetting current assets if you're going to be using liabilities to pay current assets then it's a current liability so although it's a sinking fund bond sinking fund bond usually it's a long-term non-current non-current asset generally speaking it's a non-current asset but since it's since the money there will be benefiting a current liability it will turn it into a current asset because you have to use it in the current period. Therefore, one is correct. We can take out B. We can take out D. Now, all we have to find out, if two is correct, then the answer is C. If two is incorrect, it's not correct, the answer is A. 
A bond sinking fund is an example of an appropriation of retained earning. Is it an example of appropriation? Yes, appropriation means restricted. When you have a bond sinking fund, you will tell the users, you have to appropriate retained earnings. So if you're putting away $300,000 in a bond sinking fund, you have to reserve retained earning 300,000 because it's restricted for a specific purpose. So a bond sinking fund is an example. Yes, therefore C is the answer. Again, the, this topic is an important topic on the exam and it's a very, much covered topic in my intermediate accounting course. Once again, I would like to invite you to like this recording, subscribe, check out my website if you want to add 10 to 15 points on your CPA exam. Have a good understanding. Be comfortable with all these topics. Good luck, study hard, and stay safe during those coronavirus days.